Now, hopefully you're here in Revelation chapter 17, and uh, let's pray. Lord, you are just so good, just so love the worship this morning. When we is singing, are you worthy? Oh, you are. You are so worthy. And we've already seen that in the book of Revelation, that song being sung, and we're going to see it again later on, that you are worthy, holy, holy, holy. And we even saw here that who can open the scroll? None but our Savior, Jesus. And, and Lord, as we just continue our journey through Revelation, Lord, it's been so enlightening. It's been revealing, which is your intent. And as we look at this particular chapter and looking at really how the world will be deceived and how we see it happening through religion, oh, Lord, I pray that none of us fall into that trap of being religious, but that we have a relationship with you. And we know so many people that are lost and need you. And uh, we just pray that we would be that light, be that hope, because we point them to Jesus. So, Lord, bless this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. We all said, amen. So, we come to a chapter this morning that deals with religion. You know, it's been said that man is incurably religious. In fact, it was Karl Marx who coined the phrase, religion is the opium of of the people. And why is that? Well, because God created man. He created us to worship him. And if we don't worship the true and living God, we will replace that with something else. If we don't worship God, we'll worship an image made of wood or stone. If a man doesn't worship an image, he'll worship the earth, like a mountain or a, a monument. If he doesn't worship the earth, he'll worship the constellations, maybe the sun or the moon. If he doesn't worship the constellations, he'll worship the works of his own hands, his achievements or his accomplishments. And if he doesn't worship his works, he'll worship himself. Man is incurably religious. I think it, I put it even on the statement here in our outline this morning. No man chooses whether or not he will worship. He simply chooses what or who he will worship. And so this goes all the way back, as we're going to see today, back to Mystery Babylon religions. So we'll be looking at the days. Because see, since the fall of man, Satan has been seeking to use the vehicle of religion to deceive men. And we really see it coming to its full bloom as we come to the Great Tribulation. The Antichrist, along with the false prophet, is going to unify the world under a banner of a one-world religion. A religion. And it's a system that here, the book of Revelation calls the great harlot. I mean, think about that. It's kind of an interesting name, but think of it this way. The Lord looks at the church, his bride, as a virgin bride, right? That's how he sees us. And so the false church, then it makes sense, would be called a harlot. And so God would often use this kind of analogy throughout the scriptures. For example, when the children of Israel forsook the Lord and went after idols... God said to them through the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 16 and verse 35, O oh, harlot, listen to my word. I will cease making you play a harlot. Because God's people had gone astray. So spiritual harlotry has to do with false religion. And what we have as we come to chapter 17 is the final phase, you might say, of all false religion. The synergizing of all false religions under one deceptive banner. Now keep in mind, it doesn't happen overnight. In fact, chapter 17 in, during the Great Tribulation is the culmination of really what we see happening today. We've seen this in our study through the book of Revelation. One of the organizations I referred to was the World Parliament of Religions. Its primary focus is to bring all the religions together in the world in unity. And they essentially say in their manifesto, it doesn't matter what God you believe in or if you don't believe in a God at all. Our whole intent is that we all get together, we love one another, and we're all going to heaven. The problem is, Jesus said there's only one way to the Father, and that's through me. So there's this big push today for ecumenism. And ecumenism essentially says, let's have peace at any cost. And so what has been happening over the last you know, generation, at least decades, is that you have mainstream denominations dropping, dropping their, their biblical doctrine. 
And now even linking arms with various false religions under the world, all under the banner of tolerance and, and unity. And you remember the Apostle Paul warned us of this. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, he writes this. Now the Spirit speaks expressly. In other words, this is an emphasis of the Holy Spirit that in the latter days many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. It's happening today at an alarming rate, and this will ultimately feed into the hand of the false prophet and a one-world religion. So in chapter 17, it's in full bloom. The true church, the bride of Christ, has been raptured. We see that, we saw that earlier in chapter four. But what is left now is a false church, what the Bible calls the great harlot. So that's our title for today. And we're gonna divide this time looking at two main thoughts. We have the harlot described in the first six verses, and then the remaining part we have the harlot destroyed. Quite interesting by whom we shall see. Now, we have the description beginning in verse 1. Then one of the angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, well, come and I'm going to show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Now, remember in chapter 16, we saw the seven angels who dispensed the final bowl judgments. And so now we're able to, we were right up to the very end, right up to the very end of Jesus coming. That's chapter 19. So what do we have in chapter 17 and 18? Chapter 17 is a religious view of what takes place during the Great Tribulation. Chapter 18 is an economic view of what happens during the Great Tribulation. So John is now taken back. And he's talked about this great harlot. She sits on many waters. And that's a reference to humanity. If you jump down to verse seven or uh, verse 15, I'm sorry, verse 15, it says, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the point is this, this one world religion will be worldwide, covering all humanity. Verse two, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth, so that's everyone, was made to drink of the wine of her fornication. Now, fornication is sex outside of the bonds of marriage. And so we're told here that the kings and the rulers, the inhabitants of the earth, will be joined with this woman. And, and it's, again, it's a spiritual harlotry, joined with her. The false church, all under this banner of we all want to get along, we all love everything, you know, we are the world, that kind of thing. But you know what the Bible says of the true church? In 1 John 2, 15, we're exhorted to not love the world. Do not love the world, nor the things in it. But the heart of it, the false church, is joined with the world. It's very worldly. And notice she makes drunk, all drunk with the wine of her fornication. In other words, uh, the, this false church will be inebriated. Everyone will be inebriated with her ways, intoxicated, you might say, in a spiritual stupor and blind to the truth. And because of that, Instead of embracing Jesus Christ, ultimately they will follow the Antichrist. So this is the devastation of this harlot. This is the devastation, my friends, of religion. That's what's so tragic. You see, religion blinds people. You think by going through a process, oh, I just do this okay. I, I grew up a very religious person, but I was so carnal. I, I'm, you know, you know, addicted to cocaine, an alcoholic, and yet I'm going to church and I'm religious and I can cite all kinds of things. Can, is that crazy? But that's what religion will do. It'll blind you into thinking you're okay because you go through certain steps and you do certain things. But it's true of any religion. I think of Hinduism. I mean, Hindus believe in reincarnation. So that whole thing entraps you into its old, old thing as well because you, you know you're going to live forever, but you come back in a different life form. If you live a horrible life, you come in a lower life form like some kind of bug or vermin or you know, a rat or something. And if you live a higher life form, you, you move up the chart, you know. And people are enslaved by this. I mean, you don't kill bugs or rats. Why? Because that could be a distant relative. And I'm not joking. I mean, that's, that's the truth. And they, and, they, and they live very poorly over there. They worship cows. Therefore, they don't, they're starving, many of them, but they wouldn't eat the cow 
because they worship it. So they are enslaved by the very religion they espouse. And in all of that, it keeps them from the true and living God. So during the Great Tribulation, there will be a one-world false religion that everybody will agree on, and it will ultimately lead them away from the Lord. Now in verse 3 we read, So this angel, John is saying, carried me in the spirit into the wilderness. No distraction, here I am. And I see a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So what John sees here is that this harlot in the form of a woman is sitting on a beast that is red or scarlet. Now, who is this scarlet beast? Well, we've seen him already many times before, and we've looked at him in great detail, especially in chapter 13. It is the Antichrist. And so during the Great Tribulation, the harlot, this one world religion, will actually be riding the governing power or in tandem with the governing power of the Antichrist. You say, well, how is that possible? But remember, the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist is a man of peace. He's, a, he's the great man. He's a, hey, we all get along with everybody. He's got the one world religion, the false prophet along with him, and he's bringing everybody along. We're all getting along. And they're riding this thing together. It seems like a strange alliance. Ah, but Satan is crafty. So the beast here is the Antichrist. He's described several ways here. Scarlet, speaking of his murderous intent, full of blasphemy, because once he shows his true colors, right, in the middle of the Great Tribulation, he says, I want to be God. Worship me as God or die. And he has seven heads and ten horns. Now, hold on to that. Those, ten, those seven heads and ten horns are described in verses 7 through 12. So when we get there, we'll look at that in detail. Let me simply say this. Strange bedfellows, right? Uh, a religious system along with a, a dictator. But you will see how they come together and how, again, Satan is very crafty. So he describes the beast very briefly to let us know that this woman is on the Antichrist. And then he describes the woman. She's arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So <clears throat> the purple and gold and precious stones and pearls obviously speak of wealth. I mean, you have millions of people around the world all under one banner of faith. The harlot indeed will have wealth, influence, and power. She has in her hand a golden cup or chalice. The gold, again, is, speaks of wealth, but more importantly, there's just one chalice. Why? All of the religions in the world made to drink from one cup. And what's it full of? Abominations, blasphemies against God, against all that is holy and right, and the filthiness of our fornication. This, in other words, she's full of spiritual adultery because it's all led by what is against God, not for God. And on her forehead, verse 5, was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. Now, I'm not putting up any graphics. You can find all kind of graphics on this of art, artists' renditions of this, kind of interesting. But let's talk about what it is. First of all, mystery, it's kind of interesting. We see that word and we think of maybe an Agatha Christie novel. But a, a mystery in the scriptures is simply something that was veiled in the Old Testament and now revealed in the New Testament. Uh, for example, in Ephesians 5.32, we read about the mystery of the church, something that the Old Testament prophets and saints didn't understand, but again, revealed in the New Testament. So here we have this mystery woman now revealed. Who is she? Well, she's Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And so this leads us into the origin of the deception. Listen, all false religion can be led back to Babylon. By the way, there are many books on this. Uh, you can study it if you want. Probably one of the best is The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Deep read, but quite interesting. But let's just look at it biblically. Genesis chapter 10. After the flood, Noah has three sons. One of them is Cush. Cush, his son, begets a son. His name is Nimrod. And Nimrod was a hunter. And he was the one who established the city of Babel. 
from where we get Babylon, Babel. Now, Nimrod was an apostate, so he didn't follow after God. In fact, he forsook God. And he builds this big tower. He gets everybody together, this big tower, this ziggurat, up into heaven. In other words, this is what our hands achieve. This is what we shall do. Man prided himself in that. And this is the origin. Right here began this pagan worship, astrology, sorcery, on and on it goes. And, of course, God put an end to it. He confused their language, hence the name Babel. And we use that term to babble. But it was in Babylon that pagan worship first began. Now, just an interesting footnote. I just, sometimes I get a little bit off. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but some interesting thoughts on the origin of what took place here. Nimrod married a woman by the name of Simiramis. Simiramis was the high priestess uh, of all their idol worship. Now, ancient accounts, as well as extra-biblical records, record for us that Simiramis uh, claimed to have a virgin birth. Uh, a claim, not true. And she conceived a son by virgin birth. And his name was Tammuz. Now, Tammuz, then, because of that, was touted as a savior, a messiah. I don't know if you're beginning to see the story. Sounds a little similar, doesn't it? Now, Tammuz, being a hunter like his dad was, Nimrod, he, one day he went out hunting, and Tammuz was killed. He was gored to death by a boar. Then legend says that his mother, Simiramis, prayed for him for 40 days, and he was raised from the dead. Interesting, huh? And here begins the mother-child worship. As the nation Babylon began to fade away, other nations proliferated the same false worship. Phoenicia called Simiramis Ashtoreth, and Tammuz was called Baal. In Egypt, she was called Isis and Tammuz Osiris. In Greek mythology, she was called Aphrodite and Tammuz Eros. In Roman worship or idol worship, she was called Venus and Tammuz Cupid. So Mystery Babylon is where the whole worship of mother-child worship began, which, by the way, still goes on today. By the way, uh, another interesting footnote for Simiramis' name, Simiramis was also called the Queen of Heaven. Isn't that an interesting name? In fact, she's mentioned through that name in the scriptures. For example, uh, God told the prophet Jeremiah, you need to go to my people, they have forsaken me. And, and Jeremiah confronted the people in the book of Jeremiah for following after Simiramis. And we read in Gen uh, Jeremiah 44, 16, they said, we won't listen to you, Jeremiah, but we will do whatever has gone out of our mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven, and we will offer our drink offerings to her. And then we have the worship of Tammuz in the Bible as well. Ezekiel has a vision of all of the, uh, the abominations of idol worship going on. And in Ezekiel 8, 14, he says, God brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, there were the women sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Now, why were they weeping? Well, they were, they were repeating the ceremony that Simiramis had for her son Tammuz when he was, quote, unquote, killed. She prayed and fasted for 40 days, weeping. By the way, that's people today uh, do that at this time of the year. They call it Lent. So I want you to know Lent has no origins in the scriptures whatsoever, but in reality goes back to the worship of Simiramis and Tammuz. Henry Morris had some good words. He said this, there are many striking parallels between corresponding doctrines and practices of ancient paganism, which in turn can be traced back to their origins in Babylon. The old harlot has indeed caused all nations to drink her abominable wine, including even Christian nations, end quote. So it all goes back to this. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Now, we come to verse 6, and he says, Now I saw this woman, and she, not only that, not only is she uh, the origins of false worship, but this woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So John sees this false religious system and the people that follow it also involved in the killing of the believers during the Great Tribulation. Why? Again, because they're aligned with the beast. They will literally be involved. The religious system will be involved in putting to death true believers. 
But again, no surprise, if you know your church history, you'll know that the false church has always persecuted the true church. If you didn't know that, read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Look at the things that were done, quote unquote, in the name of God to God's people. It's a tragic thing. And so notice John says, and when I saw her, then I marveled with great amazement. Well, why would he marvel? Because it's, it's, it's not that she was beautiful, but that horrendous, the fact that religion, religion would be involved with murdering people, religion keeping people from God, right? We don't think of that of someone being religious, but there is the description of the harlot, this one world religion that is beginning now and will come to its zenith in the great tribulation. Now, she will be destroyed, and we find this in verses 7 through the rest of the chapter. Now, the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I'll, I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her which has the seven heads and the ten horns. So I'll tell you all about the beast and the woman who rides the beast. Let me tell you about it. And we'll first talk about the beast, verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, what is this? Well, again, the beast is the Antichrist. And it, notice it says that his kingdom was and is not and will be. In other words, the Antichrist is part of a kingdom that used to exist. It doesn't exist now, but it will exist. And if you remember when we were in, in chapter 13, we talked about it, that, it'll, that the kingdom of which the, the Antichrist will rise will be a revived Roman Empire that did exist, doesn't exist and will exist the power for that kingdom he says ascends out of the pit in other words it comes from satan but satan and the antichrist he says will go to perdition or as we'll see in in chapter 20 he will go to the lake of fire and those on who dwell on the earth who are those people the ones who don't have their names written in the book of life in other words and those on the earth unbelievers will, will marvel why are they going to marvel because they think oh man this guy is awesome They'll think that the Antichrist, he's it, man. He's bringing peace to the nation. It's all good, right? But here is the mind which has wisdom. Take note. Because the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, first of all. So, again, it comes from a revived Roman Empire because Rome was called the city on seven hills. That's mentioned throughout history. But those seven heads also represent, verse 10, seven kings. So it comes to a revived Roman Empire, but it also has something to do with seven prior kingdoms. And he describes it. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. Now this angel is describing to John these successive kingdoms. Five which have already fallen. So when John is living, five successive world governing powers that have fallen. What are they? That would be Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Five have fallen, but one is. What kingdom was that now while this was written? It was the kingdom of Rome. It was Rome. But he says the other has not yet come. And he's referring again to that city on seven hills, that revived Roman Empire. And then he says this, and when he comes, when this ruler over this seventh kingdom comes, the Antichrist, he will continue a short while. Why just a short while? Because, verse 11, the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven. And you're going, now I'm thoroughly confused. All right? That's why. Why will that seventh kingdom only last a little while? Well, because he's also of the eighth, though of the seventh. What do you mean of the eighth? Okay, so the seventh kingdom is this reviving of a, of a former Roman Empire. Again, that would be somewhere from Western Europe. And here you have this man taking the platform. Three and a half years of peace, right? That seventh governing world power. He's going to be the first president of the world. Everybody loves him. He's great. Yes, but in the middle of the great tribulation, he will walk into the temple, the newly built temple, which we talked about. Daniel 9, Matthew chapter 24, and he will say, I am God. Worship me. And that will now be the eighth ruling power. That'll be a world-dominating dictatorship. 
Now, <clears throat> he's of the eighth, but it also says he's also of the seven. <clears throat> so how can he be this eighth power? I get that, but how could he also be of the seven? I believe that's a description here that his, this, this eighth kingdom, this despotic world governing power will be so horrific, it'll be a hybrid of all the seven dominating kingdoms before all rolled into one. He will have power, influence of all of those previous kingdoms. His kingdom will be, seem to be impenetrable, unstoppable, humanly speaking. But when Jesus returns, when we get to Matthew chapter 19, he will take this man and he will throw him into the lake of fire. Now, moving on, the angel explains the ten horns, verse 12. And the ten horns which you saw <clears throat> are ten kings who have not received their kingdom yet. And again, he's just repeating. I think he's giving us so many clear uh, clues because in Daniel chapter 2, we talked about this before, Daniel is given this 90-foot statue and it has on it the, the different you know, gold and silver and bronze and then iron. It's given these four different kingdoms and we're told that what they represent, right? Babylon, Amida, Persia, Greece. And then he gets down to Rome and it has 10 toes, Ten toes of iron mixed with clay. So it's not the pure Roman Empire. It's another empire that will arise that's a mixture. It represents the revived Roman Empire. So we believe that's exactly what it is. So what we would be referring to, if we're referring to already something that's established over in Europe, we have to talk about the European Union, right? Now, the European Union currently has 28 nations part of it. Most likely, though, 10 of them are going to rise to the top. And out of that governing power... This man will arise. Now, <clears throat> I want to throw something on you. Those of you who travel over to Europe, you've probably used a euro. <clears throat> so check this out. We could put one of those up there if we got the clip. There it is, right there. So do you know what that is, right? That's a woman riding a beast. So they're using this in their currency all the time. On top of that, in front of their parliament, and this is the parliament in Brussels, there it is in a giant sculpture, the woman riding a beast. Now, if you're going to look into the history of it, it'll tell you this is all about the fable called Europa. You can read about that. That's a pretty disgusting tale in itself alone. That, that's superfluous. The point is, here you've got a government that we believe the Antichrist will rise from, and here you've got in front of their parliament and on their money a woman riding a beast. Hello, right? Now, continuing in verse 12, it says, they receive their authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So this governing power will bring up the Antichrist. They will have their power for a while. But again, then the Antichrist becomes the dictator. He takes full control. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority then, verse 13, to the beast. In fact... Look at verse 14. These will make war with the Lamb. So all these nations assembled under the Antichrist who's taking over the world will actually do battle with Jesus. Are you kidding me? That's crazy. How is that possible? We saw that last week. Remember the nations will be deceived by those evil three demons that go out and deceive the kingdoms of the world to come to the valley of Megiddo, also called Armageddon. They will be assembled there. There will be war taking place. Jesus Christ comes back and they say, let's put him to death. And they will be conquered. We're told here in verse 14, the lamb will overcome them, right? Why? Because he's got a bigger army? No, because he is Lord of lords and king of kings. That's why he's the Lord. And then check this out. One of my favorite parts in all the Bible, not only is Jesus coming back to overcome them, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. I mean, there's going to be people coming back with Jesus? Yeah. Jump over to chapter 19, if you would, because <clears throat> we're not going to get there for a few weeks, and I love to get into this chapter as much as I can. My favorite chapter. Revelation 19, 11. John says, I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. And on he who sat him is called faithful and true. This is Jesus Christ. He judges and he makes war. His eyes like a flame of fire and his head many crowns. He's the king of kings. And he had a name that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, speaking of the work at the cross. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies in heaven, <clears throat> we just looked at these people coming with him. They were clothed in fine linen, white and clean. They followed him on white horses. Well, who is that? Well, we know who it is because he described it earlier. If you jump back to verse 7, 
We read, hey, let us be glad and rejoice and give glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife, that's the church, she's made herself ready. And to her, the church, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, the believers. So guess who's coming back with Jesus? We are. That is the ride of the, well, that's the ride of the kingdom. It's not the ride of the century. That's the ride of forever. Hello? All right, now you go back to Revelation 17. <clears throat> so Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus will defeat his enemies. And he said to me, that's the angel, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. In other words, the whole world will be uh, persuaded or diluted <clears throat> by the false religious system and by the Antichrist. The ten horns which you saw on the beast. Now this is interesting. Check this out. The ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot. So wait a second. You got the harlot riding the beast, the woman riding the beast, but all of a sudden now the beast turns and is angry with the woman. In fact, it says, and it'll make her desolate and naked, and he will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. You say, what's going on here? I thought that the Antichrist and the, <clears throat> and the one word religion were just doing fine. They were, until the middle of the Great Tribulation. Again, they will be like buddies. The Antichrist will use the harlot, will use the one world religion to persuade all of the people. But then when the Antichrist goes in the temple and says, worship me, I am God, he does away with the world religion. He does away that I don't need that system anymore. It, he used it for his own power, and he will devour it probably killing all those, well, he will kill anyone who will not worship him. By the way, can I just say this? That's how Satan operates. That's Satan's MO. He'll use somebody or something for his purpose, and when he's done with it, he'll discard it. And what we see him doing here with the harlot, he does in people's lives, doesn't he? He promises people success. He promises them power, wealth, popularity, whatever it is. Do your own thing. Have your, and, and you just, man, you're just gobbling it up. And then when he uses you, he squeezes out the juice, he discards you like trash. And, it, and it's heartbreaking. When I see people that are destitute and they've, they've, their lives are messed up, yes, they've made decisions to do that. But it's also the devil behind them lying to them all the way. You're worthless. You're a nobody. You'll never change you can't change. Look at the way you've lived. God can't forgive you. And he lies to people. And he takes them down a road. And he says, you know, you're doing great. And all the way, he's leading them down a road to nowhere, to destruction. And I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe that's where you've been at or where you're at right now. And you're thinking, there's no hope for me. And I just can't help doing what I'm doing. Yes, you can. I just want you to listen. Listen. Jesus said, the devil comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I came to give you life. I came to give you life, real life, real hope, today and now. We're gonna close in a moment, and I wanna give you an opportunity to accept Jesus as your savior. There was a couple people that gave their lives in the first service, and one gentleman came here. He was invited by a friend. First time he came. I met him out in the foyer afterwards, and he came up front. He said, I need Jesus so bad. I said, brother, you're going to have a new life from this day forward. You can have that. If you can come here at one person, you can leave a changed person, a changed life, a new life, a man or a woman who has real hope because Jesus is residing in your heart. Don't pass up that opportunity. And so Satan is a liar. <clears throat> now, Look at it, verse 13. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give the kingdom to the beast and to the words of God are fulfilled. In other words, this whole thing is this. People are making their choices, but God has known all of this. He's allowed all this happen to ultimately judge sin. And then he says, and the woman who you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And that great city in context, of course, is Babylon. And what the angel is saying is this. The harlot which you saw is identified, this false religious system. It came out of Babylon. <clears throat> and so in chapter 17, again, the, the harlot is described. It's the whole false religious system that has begun from the very beginning and comes to its zenith in chapter 17. And so just as we wind up our time, we see there's going to be a one world religion. And, and we are well on our way to see that. 
the platform has been set globally. It, it, it's not hard to see. As I even opened up with all these religions dropping their doctrines, gathering together in these uh, gatherings. I mean, there, there's 12,000 to 15,000 of these head leaders of religions around the world. They're all getting together and they're chanting and they're doing different things. Just, it's just kind of strange to watch this. But what brings them all together is this idea of tolerance and unity and, you know, what they would see as or call love. And it's a deception. We see it happening. It sounds so good to the world. So the stage is set. Now, when we see these things happening then, that tells me we need to be doing three things. Three things, okay? Number one, we need to be discerning, okay? We really need to be discerning because we want to stay in God's word, amen? Amen. We don't want to go to the right or to the left because, listen, I've seen churches that started out well and some, you know, 20 years, 30 years down the line, they're, they're just doing weird stuff. And, and I, it's shocking because the people stopped being discerning. So here's what Paul tells us to do. This is what I, as your pastor, tell you to do. Acts 17, 11. You know what Acts 17, 11 says? It says, don't believe everything a pastor tells you. And that includes me. That includes me. You need to be reading the scriptures. That's why I like to stick to the scriptures so much. It keeps me on safe ground. Acts 17, 11 says this. Paul commended the Bereans because they received the word of God with all readiness, but they searched the scriptures daily to see if this was so. So when we hear all these new things, check the scriptures. What do they say? Secondly, I think this should drive us to pray. When we see these things happen, it should drive us to pray. It should drive us to pray for the lost. To pray for the lost. Because there are so many people that are being lied to, being ripped off, being deceived. And let's just pray. Let's just pray for one last revival before the Lord comes. Let's pray for those people we love. We, I talked about earlier before we started our study about Easter coming up and being in an Andrew and praying for some people. Man, write some people down that they don't know Jesus, your neighbor, or someone you see frequently. Pray for them. Pray for an opportunity. Maybe it's the person at the cleaners that you see regularly or it's the person in the grocery store. Invite them. Ask them. We need to pray. We need to have a passion for the lost. And then finally, I would say this. When we see these things begin taking place, Jesus said in Luke 21, 28, you better be looking up because your redemption draws near. Jesus could come at any time. Think of how we would live differently if we believed Jesus was coming now. I'll tell you one thing. We start living a pure life. We start living a holy life. We start living an expectant life. We start living a prayerful life, praying for the lost. You know what we'll also do? We'll also tell people, hey, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. He's coming. He's coming. You know, we'd be doing, we'd, we'd just have such a passion. So we want to live with that expectancy. When I first got saved, I got saved just at the very end of the Jesus movement. And that was, like I said, that's why we put Maranatha in it. People were still greeting one another. Maranatha, I said, what does that mean? She said, the Lord is coming soon. Come, Lord. Jesus, I really? And people were doing the one-way sign. You know, now if one finger goes out the window, you, I don't know what it is, you know what I'm saying? But I would regularly see people put a finger out like this. It's how we communicated to other Christians, one way. Jesus is coming. I, I want to see one last revival. I really do. So let me say this. If you're here today, my heart weeps for you. You need Jesus because the devil wants to rip you off. He's a liar. And Jesus wants to give you hope. I've seen lives ruined. This week, a young girl that used to be part of our youth group, she passed away this week. Ripped off from the devil. Ripped off. Lied. Lied to. And I don't want to see that happen to any of our kids or any of us here. Or if you've come here for the first time, I just want you to know your family. You come here one time, your family. You are loved. But I want to tell you this, you need Jesus. Turn your heart to him. It's so easy. It's as easy as A, B, C. A, just admit you're a sinner and you need a savior. B, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and you could be saved. But see, make a commitment to him. It's not enough just to believe facts that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead. I believed those facts for years and I wasn't saved. I believe, yeah, I believe that. But I wasn't following Jesus. I wasn't committed to Jesus. Make a commitment today to turn your heart to him. So let's pray.